Do you yearn for a close relationship with God? Do you want to behold His glory? You want more of God, but don't know how to go about it. I need you to understand that this yearning from God Himself. And today, you will learn how to go all in for God in four simple steps. Also, you will learn why this is essential to your life. God created you to serve Him. Sin distorted this order, but God did all He could to restore His relationship with man. He sacrificed His only Son for you. Thus, going all in for God is possible through Jesus' sacrifice. He has opened the way for you to have a deep relationship with God. Now, how can you do this? Step 1. Repent of past sins. Ever since Adam fell short of God's glory, sin has stood between man and God. According to the book of Genesis, God comes in the evening to fellowship with Adam and Eve. However, this communion stopped when sin came into the picture. And the first mark is that men began to hide. They can't approach God again. But when Jesus came, He tore the veil of sin and death. He opened the portal of repentance. And man can now approach God. Romans 3.23-24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus has redeemed you through His blood. However, you need to tap into His provision by confessing and forsaking your sins. If you want to go all in for God, your old man must die. Old man refers to your old lifestyles, attitudes, and behaviors that do not align with God's will. You must forsake them all because they are inconsistent with God's nature. God needs only those that are pure and clean. So begin cleansing by avoiding little sins, gossiping, lying, sexual immorality, or petty theft. And if you are committing more grievous sins, decide to stop them. Then, approach an altar and confess your alliance to Christ. Give your life to Him. Strike a deal to live the rest of your days according to His leading. If you can do all that, you have scaled through the first stage of getting closer to God. Step 2. Believe in God The next step after repentance is to have faith in God. This doesn't start with having faith in Him to perform a miracle. Yes, that will still happen. However, if you want more of God, you must first trust Him to help you live a holy life. This is crucial because it is only those who are holy that can walk with God. Your old man might want to rear his ugly head. It is your faith in God that will help you resist its influences. Then, you must have faith that God hears you. Your repentance might be emotional. However, one more step after that requires more than emotion. You need faith. Why? You can't see God. But when you have faith in the unseen, you will experience true divinity. Your Christianity will not be superficial and tied to the physical. You will enjoy true spiritual communion. So when you pray, believe that God hears you. Have faith in Him to shift things on your behalf. John 7.38 says, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. This is Jesus speaking here. He says if you believe in Him, rivers of living water will flow from you. The rivers of living water refer to the life of God Himself. Rivers of living water likewise refer to Jesus. It is also a testament to the existence of the Holy Spirit. Thus, your belief in God builds the Trinity in you. So do you want to have more of God? Have complete faith in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't waver in mind. Keep your heart steadfast on Him. Cherish your communication with Him above your worries and anxieties. God can't share your heart with all your cares and worries. You need to sell your heart to Him. Then, He will take care of all your problems. Believing God is also attached to believing His words. God's inspired words are what you have in the Bible. Therefore, the more you read, the more you need to confess the reality in your life. And because you do that with faith, you will see them coming to life. That's how you move deeper into God. Step 3. Baptism by Water and the Spirit Water baptism is a physical attestation to your faith. When you give your life to Jesus, water baptism shows you have died and resurrected with Him. You need to know that this is not just a religious practice. God ordained it. Remember, Jesus didn't perform any notable miracle publicly until John baptized Him. Also, heaven didn't open on Jesus until He had performed His spiritual activity. That means water baptism is crucial on earth and in heaven. It opens a new platform between you and God. 
So if you haven't done a water baptism, you need to do that as soon as possible. It's a crucial step in your walk with God. Moreover, John 3, 3 through 5 says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked, Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. This verse highlights the importance of water baptism. It's a sign that you are now born again. Nonetheless, you also need the Holy Spirit baptism. When you give your life to Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. However, when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, He can express Himself in you. So after salvation, you have the Holy Spirit. After baptism, the Holy Spirit has you. This is very crucial in your relationship with God. Why? Spirits can only communicate with spirits. And according to John 4.24, God is a spirit. And you, as a worshiper, can only worship Him in spirit and truth. Thus, you need the Holy Spirit to go deeper with God. That is when the living water can flow in you. Have the Holy Spirit baptized you? If not, then you need to thirst for it. It happened on the day of Pentecost. It can happen in your life right now. Ask the Lord to baptize you with His Spirit. You need Him to pray. You need Him to watch. You need Him to do the will of God. At the top of it all, you need Him to walk with God. Step 4. Fellowship with God This is the practical step of going all in for God. But first, I have a question for you. Why do you want to go all in for God? Why are you longing for Him? Many long after God for selfish reasons. They perform the three steps mentioned earlier for personal gain. Thus, they miss the last step. They begin to find it hard to fellowship with God because of the carnal things within them. They are still fleshy. And according to the book of Romans, the flesh cannot please God. You must always walk in the Spirit for you to fellowship with God. And how do you start? Consecrate more time for God's Word. You can't claim to love someone you don't spend time with. Hence, if God is your goal in life, spend time with Him daily. Plan your schedule in a way that accommodates Him. When you do this, He is happy and rejoices. You are telling Him that a man can still consecrate his life for Him. And as you study God's Word, you must back it up with prayers. Now, you need to pause a bit here. We are prone to praying about our needs. We always want to tell God what we want. But for a man who wants to build intimacy with God, you need to speak less about your needs and ask for more of Him. Center your prayers around what will strengthen your bond with Him. Ask for more of His Spirit. Pray for more understanding of His Word. Ask for the grace and power to live above unrighteousness. This is how you grow in fellowshipping with God. And the more you do all these, the easier God finds speaking with you. You will begin to hear His audible voice. 1 John 1.3 says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. This Bible verse points to a biblical truth that you must not ignore. As much as your altar must be burning, don't neglect fellowship with the brethren. This also strengthens your bond with God. Now, why do you need to go all in for God? Is there any benefit to walking with Him? You need to go all in for God because this is the purpose of your existence. God didn't create you to walk the earth for some years, give birth to children, acquire material things, and die. No. If that's all you do, you've only lived a natural life. Your real purpose is to walk with God. He created you to return to Him with your spirit. Also, you can only find meaning in God. Thus, if you refuse to walk with Him, you will only live an earthly life, and everything earthly will perish. But when you walk with God, He will show you the blueprint of your life. You will not make assumptions, but divinely orchestrated decisions. You will not live a meaningless life. When you read the scriptures, you will notice that men who walked with God left an indelible mark on the earth. Until today, none has surpassed their spiritual prowess. Why did this happen? They put all their lives on God. You need to do the same today to live a purposeful life. The benefits of giving all to God are uncountable. Are we to talk about clear direction and divine guidance? Divine provisions? Protection? The list is endless. God is all in all. Therefore, walking with Him is tapping into an endless supply of heavenly treasures. Men may not see it, but you will know God is working on your behalf. Remember, 
There's nowhere else to go or anyone else to look up to except God. Give your all to Him today. He's eagerly waiting for you. You will never regret it here on earth and in eternity. Have you ever been so desperate for something that you would give anything to have it? Children often feel this way about toys they see in the store or in commercials, but adults often feel this way too. I'm sure nearly every one of us has paid for overpriced water when we were desperately thirsty. In that case, you are sacrificing money. But when we are truly desperate for God, we sacrifice more than that. When we give ourselves to Him, we give up our old selves, become new people in Christ, and gain so much more than we lose. In general, the feeling of desperation is something we like to avoid. We like to be in control and not have to rely on others. When we are desperate, we are vulnerable. Think of the story of Jacob and Esau in Genesis chapter 25. Esau had been out in the country all day, and when he returned home, Jacob was cooking stew. Esau had worked up quite the appetite, and he was starving. Jacob saw an opportunity and offered Esau a bowl of stew in exchange for his birthright, which was given to the oldest male in the family. Esau figured that without the stew, he would die, and his birthright would be rendered useless anyway, so he agreed. In this example, Esau made a foolish mistake because he lost far more than he gained in the bargain. He received temporary relief from his hunger, but he lost all of his privileges as the firstborn. He was desperate for immediate relief and didn't give a thought to the future. My friends, when we give up our old selves in exchange for life in Christ, we shift our focus from the present to the future, from the earthly realm to the heavenly realm. Colossians 3 verses 2 to 4 says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. If you want to receive a place with God in heaven, you must be desperate for him. There is no way to heaven except through Christ. In John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Just as the only way to satisfy hunger is to eat, the only way to get to heaven is by giving yourself to God. I'm not going to lie. It takes a lot to give yourself to God. It might require you to sever a relationship or two. It will require you to say no to a lot of things you would rather say yes to. It could even cost you your life. You may be wondering how that could possibly be worth it. Giving up your life for God may seem like a foolish bargain, but unlike Esau, you will receive far more than you give. James 4, 7-10 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Yes, God requires you to bow down to him, to give your life to him. You must acknowledge that he is the one true God and is the most powerful being to ever exist. When you do that, when you give your love to God, he will return it. He will lift you up higher than you could ever go on your own. You must lower yourself before you can be lifted. God will come near to you and be by your side through every trial. It's during times of trials and suffering that we tend to be the most desperate for God. As Psalm 34, 17 to 18 says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. When David was being hunted by Saul, he cried out to God for deliverance, and God looked after him. When Hannah desperately wanted a child, she prayed to God, and he delivered Samuel to her. When the disciples were on a ship in a storm, they begged for Jesus' help, and he calmed the wind and waves. Over and over again, the Bible shows how God delivers his people from their troubles when they call to him. And they do call because when life seems impossible, he is the only one 
who can make it possible. God wants us all to call out to him in times of trouble. He wants to be there for you, and you can trust that he will be. God promises to look out for all his children. Matthew 7, 7 to 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What a great comfort it is to have God nearby when we need him most. I have a question for you today, my friends. When are you desperate for God? The obvious answer is during times of trouble like we've just talked about, but that's not the right answer. The right answer should be always. I'm not saying that you should always be in time of trouble and I very much hope that you are not, but I'm saying that we should be desperate for God all the time whether things are going well or not. We should wake up desperate for God. We should be desperate for God on the commute home from work and when we lay down to sleep at night. To be desperate is to be vulnerable and to be vulnerable is frightening. But you don't have to be afraid when you give yourself to God. He already knows everything about you because he is all-knowing. He has seen every time you have disobeyed him and loves you anyway. You never have to be afraid to go to him. What does it mean to be desperate for God? It means you want to continually grow in your relationship with him by learning more about him and relying on him. It means that you read and study your Bible to learn as much as you can about his love and how you can return it. It means doing your very best to follow God's commands every day. It means showing love to those around you, like Jesus showed love to all people. It means giving yourself over to God, utterly and completely. As 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. If you are hesitant to give yourself to God, remember what he has already done for you. God sent his only son into this world to die so that we could be saved from our sins. 1 John 4.8-10 says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. God is not asking you to blindly trust him. He has already demonstrated his love for you in the most powerful way possible. He asks us to make sacrifices for him, but he made the ultimate sacrifice first. The next time you are struggling to obey one of God's commands, such as loving your neighbor, remember what God has done for you. Return the love he has showed you. My friends, when we are desperate for God, when we give ourselves over to him, we will receive so much more than a bowl of stew. In John 6.35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. While earthly bread and water temporarily satisfy our physical needs, Jesus permanently satisfies all of our needs. Without him, we will starve and die. But with him, we will be forever fed and receive eternal life. While Esau made a foolish bargain by focusing on his present needs, when we give ourselves to God, we are focusing on both our present and future needs. We receive the immediate reward of God's presence and love in our lives, and the future reward of a place with him in heaven. As Colossians 3, 1-4 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Our lives on earth are temporary, but we can look forward to eternal life with our true Father. Are you desperate for God in every circumstance? Do you call on him? 
not only to ask for his help when you need it, but also to thank him for everything he has given you. If you don't already, I encourage you to begin and end your day with prayer. Thank God for the start of a new day and the end of an old one. Spend time in the Word so you can learn more about God and all that He has done for you and me, and don't keep your faith to yourself. When you are desperate for something, it should be obvious. You don't have to loudly broadcast your faith, but when your faith is strong, it should be obvious to others. Your words and actions should reflect your faith in God. Take to heart the words of Jesus to the disciples in Matthew 28, 19-20 where he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Encourage others to be desperate for God and never forget that he is with you. The best decision you can ever make in this life is to surrender yourself to God. When you give yourself over to God, you will receive vast blessings that outweigh any possible trial. Christians do not have easier lives than non-Christians, but they do have better lives. When you have God on your side, you know that you can face anything, and you can look forward to the blessings you receive in both this life and the life to come. What does it look like to surrender to God? Paul explains this well in Galatians 2.20, where he writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This may seem confusing at first, but let's unpack the statement bit by bit. Firstly, Paul states that he died with Christ and no longer lives. You may be wondering then why we say that God grants us life. Paul is not dead but has been reborn and lives again through his faith in Christ. I don't mean this in a literal sense but in a spiritual sense. When Paul says that Christ lives in him, he is saying that he has dedicated his life to Christ and he now lives it for God rather than for himself. This is made very clear in the distinction between Paul's life before his conversion and after it. Before he was converted, Paul went by the name of Saul and dedicated his life to persecuting Christians. But after he came to Christ, he spent the remainder of his days as a missionary. He faced persecution and prison, but he consistently maintained his faith in God. He lived for himself as a persecutor, but when he was being persecuted, he was living for Christ. But why would Paul do this? Why would he give up his comfortable and safe life to live in danger? His answer is in his statement when he says, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. These words echo 1 John 4, 9-10, which says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God loved Paul before Paul ever loved him. God demonstrated the great love he has for his people by sending his son to earth to die on the cross and face the punishment that we deserve. In order to fully appreciate the sacrifice, we have to understand its implications. When we look back on the beginning of time when God created Adam and Eve, he told them, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. As we know, Adam and Eve did eat the forbidden fruit, and as a result, sin and death entered the world. Every single one of us is a sinner, just like Adam and Eve, and every one of us deserves to die and be sent to hell. But God loves us so much that he doesn't want to see us be punished, no matter how much we deserve it. This is why he sent Jesus to earth. Jesus is fully God and fully man. He lived a regular human life so that he could take our place in death. He faced the same trials and temptations that you and I face, but he maintained a perfect life and went willingly to the cross. He died and took on our punishment so that God's people would not have to go to hell, but would join him in heaven after death. And now 
He serves as a mediator between us and God, connecting us to heaven and God to earth. This means that God's people do not have to fear death. When we leave this earthly life, we enter our heavenly life. We get to join our Father in heaven and live in perfect communion with Him. We will have no more suffering, no more crying, and so many more blessings than we could even imagine. But before we receive the blessings of heaven, we get to experience blessings from the Lord here on earth. One of these blessings is that God is always with us. He is always watching over us in both good times and bad. We can always count on Him to know exactly what is going on and to be there to comfort us in our time of need. We can turn to Him with all of our concerns. In fact, He wants us to bring our problems to Him. He wants to carry our burdens for us. All we need to do is lay them at His feet. In Acts 12, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, was sent to prison for preaching the Word of God. When Peter was arrested, the church earnestly began praying for his release. This was a dangerous time for Christians, so they had reason to worry for Peter's safety. But they put their worry in God's hands. The night before his trial, Peter was chained up in the middle of two guards with sentries standing at the doors. Escape seemed impossible. But then an angel of the Lord appeared to Peter and released him from his chains. The angel commanded Peter to follow him, and he did. As they walked along, the doors opened for them, and none of the guards seemed to notice them. Peter thought he was having a vision, but once he was out of the prison, he realized that the angel had truly led him to freedom. He went to the house of Mary, where a group of Christians had gathered together to pray for him. When he knocked on the door, a servant named Rhoda recognized his voice and rushed to tell the people that he was outside. They did not believe her until Peter kept knocking and they eventually opened the door to see him standing there. The group was overjoyed for their prayer had been answered. Even though Peter might have felt alone while he was chained up in prison, the Lord was always with him and Peter's arrest was always part of God's plan. He used God's imprisonment to perform a miracle and strengthen the church's faith in him. I hope that you and I will never be in prison for our faith, but many people are. But no matter what you go through, God is always with you. Bring your concerns to him, for he will hear you, and he will take away your burden from your shoulders. But for God to take your burden, you must ask for his help and be willing to give him all that he needs. Surrendering your life to God is not a simple matter. It will change everything. God has a very different set of rules for us than the world does. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When you surrender to God, you are choosing to obey His will rather than your own. You will have to make sacrifices. You will have to give up everything that is displeasing to God, no matter how much you enjoy it. It will be a struggle to maintain your faith at times, and you will find temptation around every corner. But my friends, your life will become so much better. True treasure is found in heaven, not on earth. Matthew 6, 19-20 reminds us, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Heavenly treasures are worth so much more than anything on this earth. You may think that you have nothing in life, but as long as you have God, you have everything. God loves you more than you will ever know. He knows every single piece of you and He loves it all. God is our true Father in heaven, is our true home. Our blessings come from above, not from ourselves or from this world. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Earthly wealth and happiness can slip your fingers faster than you can imagine. But God is forever. Heaven is forever. God loves you now and always. He will never leave you or forsake you. When you cling on to Him, He will hold you above the surface and keep you from drowning. But when you look away from Him, you will fall. He showed His love for us before we even knew what love was. 
He sacrificed his greatest treasure so that we could store treasures in heaven. He wants us to surrender to him so that we can join him in heaven someday. He wants us to cling to him throughout our life so that we can be held above the surface. God blesses us with his presence and power every single day. He is holding your hand through every trial and listening to your prayers. He is waiting with open arms for you to fall into them. My friends, if you have not surrendered to God yet, what are you waiting for? The other day, I was watching a movie, and one of the characters broke down as she explained how scared she was of being alone. It is terrible, she said. Well, I was in agreement with her. As much as I enjoy solitude, there are times when I crave social connection. There are moments when I miss my friends, the good old days, when we would sit in our rooms in college till midnight, talking about the silliest topics. I miss the evening strolls when we ate different types of street food, laughing all the way. Loneliness can be scary. We are social beings who desire close connections with people who get us. Very few people want to be alone in this world. Do not ever be afraid of being alone, because you never will be. God is always with you. He has promised you that he will never leave you nor forsake you. When Jesus was preparing the disciples for his departure, this is what he told them. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot receive him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you do know him, for he abides with you, and he will be in you. When we seek the kingdom of God first, we may stand alone because the world has become more corrupted, and few people care about pursuing God or his kingdom. The pursuit of material possessions is what the majority of people focus on. They consider material wealth as the standard of success. As a result of pursuing wealth, many people, Christians included, have sinned. As a believer, when you choose not to conform to the standards of the world, you may find yourself alone. The good news is that in the true sense, you will never be alone. God is always with you. Do not let go of your salvation in pursuit of the temporary pleasures of the world. Do not deprive yourself of eternal life in heaven because there is someone you might offend because of your faith in God. Some of us feel obliged to please our families, to keep the wrong friends, and to be cool and popular with our classmates just because we are afraid of being alone. We fail to realize that bad company corrupts good morals. Hanging around with the wrong people can lead us away on a path away from God and all he has in store for us. Besides, you cannot please everybody. Not everyone will support your journey with Christ. Don't expect everyone to be thrilled that you have received salvation and are no longer partying with them. God has gifted you the Holy Spirit so that he can be your companion in all you do. He is your friend and helper. He is always with and within you. You are never alone. Sometimes the devil uses loneliness to try and make us forget our identity in Christ. He may suggest that you are alone because you are not enough. That is a lie. Be careful not to believe his lies. God has qualified and given you the strength to stand up for what is right, even if you have to stand alone. The prophet Jeremiah was called to a life of loneliness. He had limited social interactions. He could not marry, have a family, or even attend social celebrations. Yet God was always with him. Despite being in such deep solitude by earthly means, Jeremiah had a deep spiritual connection with God, which was more meaningful than any interactions with people. If you have experienced abandonment because of your faith in God and your calling, I encourage you to not be afraid or discouraged. Rather, no one in school wants to be your friend because you are that religious teen, or your colleagues at work gossip about you because of your spiritual convictions. Stand firm. Just because the majority disagree with you or find your beliefs ridiculous does not make you wrong. Remember, we live in a fallen world where what is wrong is now considered right. Today, choosing to follow God and obeying his commands can cause you to be labeled a social misfit. You may end up without friends, since few will relate to you. You may be sidelined out of opportunities because you do not fit in or get those odd looks when you pass by. Is it easy to stand up for godliness? No. 
is it worth it? Absolutely yes. Even when no one is supporting you, the Lord is always with you. He is to you what no man can be. No person can give you the peace and joy found in his presence. Even good people can let you down, but God will not. Only God can be your constant help, comforter, and friend. God will never get tired of you or turn his back on you. In him you have a true friend. You do not need to feel alone. While social connections with others are a gift from God, being alone is not all doom and gloom. Sometimes walking alone is necessary and can be a great blessing. There are journeys in life that require you to walk alone. There will be times when the Lord will want to have special moments with you, away from the crowds. God may want to teach you certain things about yourself or reveal himself to you in a new way. There are certain levels of grace the Lord cannot release to multitudes, deep revelations that he cannot just give to anyone. They are only for those who have accepted their calling and heed his instructions. I know accepting God's call can be scary for many. You are not alone if you are feeling the pressure. When God called Jeremiah, he wanted to find a way out of the assignment. Let's look at his excuses and God's response in Jeremiah 1, 6 through 8. 2. O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. Don't say that, the Lord replied, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Maybe like Jeremiah, your calling separates you from others. Or you could be like the disciples who had each other for support. Whatever your calling is, God is your help. If he has called you alone to an assignment, you can be sure he has given you the ability to execute it. His grace is sufficient for you. The Apostle Paul had a tough calling, but this is what he had to say in 1 Timothy 1.12. I give thanks to him who has granted me the needed strength and made me able for this, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he has judged and counted me faithful and trustworthy, appointing me to this stewardship of the ministry. The task before you may seem beyond your capabilities. The Lord who created you, the one who knew and chose you before you were even born, knows what you are really capable of. He knows that you are more than able because he is the one who strengthens you. He has given you everything you need to accomplish his will. You do not need anyone's approval to achieve the dreams and visions the Lord has put in your heart. You only need to rely on his grace and strength. If you are currently in a season of solitude, look on the bright side and enjoy the benefits of time alone. As a believer, you should not be weighed down by being alone. Instead, it is a period that you should cherish, one that has the potential to bring you closer to your Creator. Here are some benefits you can reap from being alone with God. When everyone has abandoned us or is too busy to be there for us, God will show us that He is a friend who sticks closer than a brother or sister. Times of loneliness can draw us back to His loving arms. They remind us that God is the only constant we have in life. Solitude revives our fellowship with God and breathes new life into our spiritual journey. Spending time alone with God reminds us of our identity in Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit, our help, friend, and confidant. Use this time of separation to grow close to God and learn His ways. If you do not know your assignment, this is the perfect time to find out. Free of the noise of people's opinions, God's voice will become clearer. If you already know what you should be doing but do not know where to start with your God-given assignment, this is the time to lean into his presence. Seek him for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. As we end the video, I pray the Lord will remind you that you are never alone. He is always with you. So go out there with power, strength, and courage. Go out to the nations and let the name of the Lord be known among men. Let the world know that you serve a living God. Do you ever feel like something is missing in your life? Do you desire a kind of love and acceptance that you can't find in this world? Are you looking for meaning in earthly things and not finding it? My friends, I've got to share a harsh truth with you today. Your life will never be complete until you begin to walk with God. But once you begin to walk with Him, your life will open up and you'll discover the amazing love of Jesus Christ. John chapter 15 verses 4 and 5 says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. 
Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Picture a luscious grapevine full of big juicy grapes ready for picking. Now picture a vine that has fallen away from the tree. It sits at the base of the tree, withered and empty of any fruit. Which vine do you reach for? Of course, you reach for the vine that has borne fruit. The dead vine is useless. Without Jesus, we're all dead vines. We have no access to the trunk which we need to gain nutrients which sustains us and allows us to bear fruit. When we rely only on the world, we remain spiritually dead. But when we attach ourselves to the Lord, we gain all that He provides. We receive His love, mercy, faithfulness, and grace. We are able to grow strong and be useful because we are spiritually thriving. Paul explains this concept in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, when he writes, You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. When we put off our old selves and put on our new selves, we become attached to Christ and receive all of His benefits. So, what does that look like? Well, Paul himself presents a wonderful example of what it looks like to transform from the old self to the new self. When we first learn about Paul in the Bible, his name is actually Saul. The Christians greatly fear him because he hatefully persecutes them. But one day, when he is on his way to Damascus to seek out more Christians to persecute, he's confronted by a great light from heaven, and he hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The voice explains that he is Jesus, and he tells Saul to go into the city and follow the instructions he has given there. When Saul rises, he finds that he can no longer see. He remains blind for three days until he is visited in Damascus by a man named Ananias, who the Lord sent to him. Through the power of Jesus, Ananias healed Saul's blindness and Saul was baptized that day. He changed his name to Paul and became one of the most famous and fruitful missionaries in Christian history. He went from taking the lives of Christians out of hatred to sharing eternal life with even his enemies out of love. Instead of taking life, he began to offer a new life in Jesus Christ. Saul radically transformed when he put off his old self and put on his new self. Once he gained spiritual life, he began to bear fruit for the Lord. God used him as an instrument to spread the gospel throughout Judea to both Jews and Gentiles. Paul's conversion story and his transformation are incredibly dramatic, but not all conversions are. You may not be blinded by the light of the Lord. You may have a very quiet and personal experience, and that's perfectly okay. As long as your conversion is true, it doesn't matter what it looks like. You also don't have to be as sinful as Saul to become a new person in Christ. We can easily look at Saul and see a difference in his behavior before and after his conversion. But you may look at your life and think, you aren't that bad. After all, you don't go around killing people for their faith. But the fact of the matter is, we are all sinners in need of God's saving grace. Sin is sin. It doesn't matter if it's a little white lie or tax fraud. The Bible tells us that even to lust after another woman is the same as committing adultery. To hate someone is just as bad as murdering them. You may think that you aren't that bad, but we're all equally sinful in God's eyes. But He offers eternal life to everyone, from the worst serial killer to the small child. You'll notice a change in your behavior once you put on the new man, even if you think you were living well before. When you dedicate your life to Christ instead of yourself, there'll be inevitable changes in the way you live your life. They may be small changes, but they'll become noticeable over time. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus commands us, Let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our duty on this earth is to spread the gospel through our words and actions, so that Jesus can use us to bring others to faith. While this should be a purposeful act, it should also occur naturally. Christians are meant to stand apart from the world, 
The Bible dictates how we are to behave and where our priorities lie, and these instructions differ greatly from what the world says. Paul tells the Romans to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, and he writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The big difference between Christians and the world is that we strive to follow God's will instead of our own. We place our focus on heavenly things instead of earthly things. There are certain places and events that Christians will refrain from attending because God wouldn't approve of them going there. The world might think that Christians miss out because they live for God instead of for themselves, but we gain so much more in Christ that we could ever get from the world. God gives people grace. You remember how I said earlier that we're all sinners? That sounds pretty bleak, but when you accept Jesus as your savior, all your sins are forgiven. Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross so that we could have eternal life through him. His blood washed away our sins and he paid the penalty that we deserve. The Bible calls us to treat others with the same grace that God gives us. We're told to not only love our neighbors, but even our enemies. We're called to practice patience and understanding. When we do this, we'll be noticeably set apart from the world. For example, when someone cuts you off in traffic, you might swear at them and deliver an obscene gesture. But a Christian who is actively striving to live for Christ would forgive that person and give them grace, even if they don't deserve it. That's the great thing about grace. You don't have to earn it. It's a gift that is freely given, and God extends it to everyone. He offers His grace to the meanest prisoner and the kindest nurse alike. He offers it to the wealthy and the poor, the sick and the healthy, the young and the old. No matter who you are or what you have done in your lifetime, God freely offers His grace to you. All you have to do is accept His grace and learn to live for Him. The journey will not always be easy. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This earthly life is not all there is, my friends. God tells us that we don't even belong on this earth. Our true home is heaven with our Father. And when we choose the narrow gate and live our lives for Him, we'll someday be delivered to our true home. We may experience suffering and persecution in this life on account of our faith, but it will all be worth it in the end. And in the meantime, the Lord promises to be with you always. God is always looking after His people, and we can count on Him to guide us through His will. To be a Christian requires sacrifices. We must put off our old self and reject our old ways, no matter how fun and enjoyable they might have been. We must reject sin and temptation and put on the new self to live for the Lord. Life may become more challenging, but you will never face those challenges alone. Your life will be transformed when you start living for the life to come instead of life on earth. You will discover that a lot of things you thought mattered don't actually. But my friends, if you don't accept Christ into your life, you'll always have that missing piece your life will never feel complete. No matter how much you search for meaning, you'll never find it if you don't look for it in Christ. You won't be able to look forward to the life to come because you're on a path to destruction, not heaven. Without God, you'll be looking at a future of sorrow and pain instead of eternal joy and peace. Your earthly life may seem great, but it will come at the cost of your eternal life. If you aren't serving God, then you're serving Satan, and you'll be eternally punished in hell. That sounds scary, and it should. But we should not be afraid to give our lives to Christ. He loves us and wants the best for us. He's reaching out to you right now and asking you to take his hand and walk with him. He promises to love you and give you grace and mercy. He will forgive all your sins of the past, present, and future. Will you take his hand? 
I believe Christianity would be soothing and rosy if the devil were someone that easily gives up or grows weary. Unfortunately, he never gets tired of tempting believers or trying to make them stumble in their walk with God. This is why one has to be rugged and brutal about one's faith in this present age. The world system is getting wiser and the schemes of the kingdom of darkness are designed in such a way that they weaken the faith of those who believe in God. It's disheartening to know that there are people who once had faith in God. I took a survey and found out that one major reason for this is a feeling of abandonment or disappointment in God. The devil has won the battle over the souls of many. His tested and proven tool is raining incessant troubles on believers. This frustrates them into believing that God has forsaken them. Since the devil's tactic is persistent pressure through spiritual attacks, you need to fight back with persistent faith. The book of Ephesians 6.16 says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Whatever the enemy does against the life of a believer is aimed at his faith. You may be wondering why he keeps bringing up one challenge after the other, from financial strains to emotional distress, from your spiritual life to your physical body. He keeps shooting his shots. Don't keep wondering when he's going to get tired. I have the answer for you, and it's never. He will not stop. Therefore, it is left for you to put up an impenetrable shield to avert all the schemes of hell against your belief. Faith is not just the currency with which you can receive answers to your prayers from God. It's a spiritual weapon of warfare. Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church of Ephesus, called it part of God's spiritual armor. In his description of the shield of faith, he said it is capable of putting off all the fiery darts of the enemy. This means that irrespective of the weight of whatever the enemy is bringing upon you, your faith is all you need to put off the heat, pressure, and confusion that comes with it. Have you watched a war movie? where one party releases flaming arrows into the camp of their enemy? The immediate effect is usually confusion in the camp. That is exactly what the enemy expects of you when he sparks up an unpleasant event. Just like in the movies where the attention of the attacked group is divided as some of the soldiers focus on putting off the flames, the devil also intends to divert your attention while he executes his primary goal. Your faith is the shield with which you can quench the fire. If you do not have your faith strongly rooted in God's word, when the enemy strikes, you will be forced to run helter-skelter trying to deal with the heat of the situation. This gives the enemy wider room to annihilate you. When you receive a not-so-good report from your doctor regarding your health, what do you do? Do you go about telling everyone what the doctor's report said and confessing negative things? Or do you calmly go to God for reassurance and healing? Do you fret and throw questions of unbelief at God? Or do you use it as an avenue for God to manifest his healing power? If you go on doubting God and being all pessimistic when things do not play out as beautifully as you planned them, then you're not getting ready to win the battle that the devil has unleashed on your faith. He destroyed his relationship with God, and he finds it intimidating to watch you thrive in God's love. Because he has no godly standards, he will go to any length to make you curse God. My question to you is, what will it cost you to have an unshakable faith in God? Would you rather have the devil push you to turn your back on God? Beloved, cursing God out of pain, frustration, and disappointment is not worth it. 
you need to gauge up against the pressure that comes with standing for and with God. There will be times when God's answers to your requests or queries will not come immediately. There will be times when he will seem to be silent. That is why you need to build your faith. It's okay to start up with a small and weak kind of faith, but it's not okay to remain that way. As you grow in the knowledge and the things of God, you should also grow in your trust in him. One of the unforgettable stories about persistence that I've read from the scriptures is that of the widow who troubled the judge. Although the judge did not consider her plea at first, he had to give in to her because of her consistency. On this account, Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Whether you accept it or not, your enemy operates by the natural law of consistency, which says, In consistency lies the power. Being consistent in your trust in God is the only way you can level up against him. Just like he told Eve in the Garden of Eden, he will try to make you see God as the bad guy. When God's promises take time to come to pass, he will present God as a liar. In times like these, your trust in the unchangeable God is what will determine your response. You may not know how faith aligns with prayer, but one thing that proves your level of faith in God is a fervent prayer life. The widow in this parable believed in the position and authority of the judge to help her out of her situation, and for this reason, she kept coming back to him. You can't say you have undying faith in God when you do not pray to him. This is part of the works without which the scriptures say your faith is dead. The moment you begin to feel too discouraged to talk to God in prayer, know that your trust is dwindling. At this stage, the enemy is capable of playing with your mind. He's capable of feeding you with ungodly thoughts and having you change your mind in the process. When you pray amid a storm, the peace that God gives you cannot be compared to any assurance from this world. Prayer is not just a weapon used in sending spiritual arsenals to the kingdom of darkness. It is also a tool for growing and stabilizing your faith. No matter how you feel, after praying, you receive reassurance and comfort from God. If he tells you to knock and it will be opened unto you, you trust him. If he says, seek and you shall find, then you keep seeking until you receive your request. This is the definition of persistence. Results or no results, you keep hoping that God will show up at the best time. The apostles who happened to be the first of Christians faced persecution in every way possible. They were physically tortured, locked up in prisons, and encountered shipwrecks during missionary trips. The magnitude of the attacks they received from the enemy was enormous and almost unbearable. But they kept on looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. They didn't trust God today and deny him tomorrow in the face of affliction. They were consistent and firm in their decision to believe in God more than anything and to further demonstrate the brutality of their confidence. They loved not their lives even unto death. Until you come to the point where you make up your mind to stay with God irrespective of what comes your way, the enemy will keep sifting you like wheat. If your hope in God is shallow, you are likely to give in to Satan's continual incursion. It doesn't make sense for you to be able to stand on the Lord's side when things are pleasant while you take a bow whenever the slightest trial comes your way. Nevertheless, if this is your case, I want you to know that there is still hope for you. Don't feel guilty or depressed for being unable to take a stand for God in the face of adversity. Come to God and tell him about it. The good thing about God is he does not condemn you for having little faith. He encourages you to feed on his word and grow in faith. Romans 10:17 says, consequently, 
faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. The Word of God is the major source of Christian faith. It teaches you about the person of God, and it encourages you through the dealings of God with the patriarchs of faith. The deeper you grow in the knowledge of the Word of God, the deeper your roots of faith. When the enemy has tried jeopardizing every other aspect of your life to no avail, he will then try to directly stop you from the vow of godly devotion. He will try to make you too busy to fellowship with God. He will try to keep you away from the Word of God and make you compare prayer to lifting blocks. Just like in the case of Job, Satan attacked Job's wealth, family, and health before speaking using Job's wife to ask him to curse God so that he would die. I don't know what aspect of your life the devil has been persistently waging war at, but I need you to do one thing. Do everything the Bible encourages you to do to ensure you stay with God. Your confidence in God cannot be firmly anchored if you are far away from God. A little instability in your trust is what the enemy needs to make his flaming arrows land successfully in your life. If your adversary does not relent, then I implore you not to relent as well. Your consistency in trust has to be more consistent than the attacks of the devil, or else you may be caught off guard. Focus on building your faith, not on stopping the enemy from launching more assaults. You have no control over his activities, but your faith can shield you from all his flaming arrows. Stay rooted in faith. You are fighting a defeated foe. Your victory is certain.